Hello, are we live?
Hello? I've no idea, am I supposed to start? <laughs> or are we just waiting for something? Hello, hello. I just don't seem to hear anything. Okay, I think um, I, I was expecting a kind of sign to uh, to allow me to uh, to start my workshop. Um, I'm not sure whether that didn't come through or not. But anyway, welcome uh, to this workshop. Shop, thank you, thank you for joining us today. Um, we will be talking about FARPI, the uh, Financial Grade API. You may already have heard something in previous sessions uh, that I noticed on the agenda. Um, I will also be talking about Akana, obviously, because that's the company I represent. And I will show you how we at Akana help you to create your um, Financial Grade APIs and how you can actually also publish these APIs to your consumer audience. Um, my name is Olaf, Olaf van Gorp. I am a solutions consultant with Akana. I've been there for over six years now. I have a keen interest in open banking, open banking security in particular, and that's why I'm very happy to be hosting this uh, workshop with you today. So uh, this is kind of what we're going to do in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, so obviously, I will show you uh, one or two things regarding to uh, financial grade APIs and how Akana helps you dealing with them. Um, and the reason why I do so is that I feel that you as an audience will, well, first of all, have an interest in APIs, so otherwise you wouldn't be here. You probably have some kind of connection associating, association with the financial domain. Um, and that's why I'm pretty certain that you will come across FAPI, Financial Grade API, uh, in the time to come if you have not already done so. Um, so I think it's it's a good moment to kind of share some of the experience that we at Akana have with uh, FAPI. One thing we clearly see is that it's really uh, getting an increased significance. So a few years ago it was there, but you know nobody was really talking about it too much. But now we see that it's getting a significant place, including some of the uh, present open banking standards, and that's a very good thing. Um, so this API Days event, obviously a fantastic stage uh, to explain something about FAPI and Arcana, because let's face it, APIs, financial domain, embedded finance, there you go. Um, so what I will eventually show you is how you can deal with these financial grade APIs in a no-code fashion, which is uh, pretty spectacular, I think. But prior to that, um, let's... Um, zoom into the environment that I will be using for this, which is a digital banking portal. And this is actually a portal that Akana has released recently. Uh, it's publicly available. I will show the link with you later. And we have, or at least we intend this to be a kind of a, a reference portal, a showcase, if you will, where we publish um, open banking APIs in a means that we think will fit any bank that uh, wants to publish such APIs. Uh, with a very specific focus on the consumer of those APIs, because it's one thing to you know create uh, financial grade APIs, but it's another thing to effectively publish them. And that, at the end of the day, is obviously what you want to do. You want to make those APIs accessible to your developers in in a very efficient uh, way that allows them to effectively interact with those APIs. So what we intend to do with this portal is provide. Um, APIs that are FAPI conformant, and we intend to do that in a few iterations, kind of to gradually provide all that information and all that capability that you need to effectively inter uh, interact with a fully 100% conformant API. But you can already check out the site today. It's there, it's live, there's some APIs in there, and I will presently show you uh, how all that works. Um, but before we do that, let's also have a brief summary of FAPI itself, because obviously I have no idea how comfortable you as the audience are uh, with this particular topic. Again, I think it's going to be very relevant to you one way or the other now or in the near future. Um, but in order to have an understanding of, let's say, the challenges that come with FAPI 
from both an API provider as well as an API consumer perspective, I think it's very useful to have that little bit of background. So let's go right ahead and explain something about that. So FAPI, you probably know, is created by the OpenID Foundation, uh, an industry consortium. It's meant as a security profile for APIs in the financial domain. And when we talk about financial grade APIs, that essentially means APIs that give access to sensitive data, to confidential data, and financial data obviously uh, fall into that category. I mean, we're all very happy that we now have apps where we can have a payment function in there, so that allows us to direct uh, uh, to directly pay from the app uh, to the merchant without you know the intervention of the bank. That's all fine, but we also find it very important that this whole transaction is secure, and that's obviously where open API and an API security profile like FAPI comes in. So uh, from a very high level, you could say that what FAPI uh, is doing uh, or has done is they have identified some vulnerabilities with the, uh, let's say, the common OAuth and OpenID Connect standards. And obviously, these standards were created as uh, authentication authorization standards for APIs in general. But when we talk about sensitive APIs, it was clear that there were some vulnerabilities that were not really covered in those standards as they were. So the FAPI spec is further constraining or hardening, if you will, those standards. And I think that in itself is a fantastic exercise because what it will definitely result in is a much higher level of interoperability. The situation that we find ourselves in, obviously, is that as a third party, you want to interact with open APIs. Uh, you probably want to interact with APIs from a multiple number of sources, so many different banks, for example, and it would be very, very painful if you needed to interact or create an implementation with each and any of these banks with you know, a slightly or even radically different security profile on top of these APIs. That's not very interoperable. So the fact that with FAPI you have a clear standard that really specifies um, you know, where OAuth may still tell you you could either go left or right. FAPI will clearly say you must go right here. So there's no uh, there's no discussion. So it's a very clear spec, very detailed, uh, allows for brilliant automation. And the fact that you get this interoperability also means that at the end of the day, it will have a positive effect on your cost, uh, the cost uh, the cost associated with the implementation. So it's also very good from a cost effective uh, perspective. Um, in terms of the scope, uh, just a little remark on that. I mean, you might think that FAPI is like a comprehensive API security solution. And even though it covers, you know, critical elements like authentication and authorization, uh, it does not really cover all of the use cases, nor does it intend to at this stage. Uh, so you might summarize it as that it, it, you know, it focuses very strongly on consent. Uh, but it does kind of uh, ignore intent. So even if I have a valid client, a valid authentic client, um, there may still be a user uh, sitting behind uh, the screen that has malicious intent. And that is also something that you will need to address for uh, if, if, as part of a comprehensive API security um, um, program. So um, FAPI applicable to services that really require that higher level of security. Um, talking about some of those vulnerabilities, you will see that, uh, for example, um, regarding OAuth bearer tokens, that FAPI looks at um, the potential use of a bearer token by somebody that the token was not granted to in the first place. So a bearer token is very often compared to like a bus ticket. Anyone that happens to find the ticket can enter the bus, even though the ticket may not have been um, given to that person in the first place. And with a bearer token, it's very much the same thing. So should a token leak, should somebody get access to a valid bearer token, that person might actually try and access the API using the token. FAPI now uh, addresses that issue by um, uh, specifying sender constraint tokens. So it means that the token must be bound to somebody that to something that that absolutely ties it to that particular client that the token was granted to, that the token was given to. So in this case, for example, tying it to the client certificate that was used by the client to connect to the authorization server in order to gain the token. And talking about that process of, of receiving the access token, that itself is also subject to binding. So 
um, the authorization request itself, for example, whereas under OAuth, that is a fairly straightforward GET request with a number of parameters in your uh, query string. With FAPI, you have to provide those parameters as a signed request object, so a JSON web token with a signature associated with it that allows the server to validate the signature and then allows the server also to make sure that no tampering has happened with any of the claims inside the JSON uh, web token. We'll look at a more detailed example shortly. Um, so I like to summarize it as such that FAPI really ensures the integrity of the binding between end user client and API endpoint. They try to make sure that nothing can kind of get in between. Um, in terms of the present security profiles, um, there's two main uh, parts to it currently and a few additional parts that I will ignore for now. So there is a read-only API security profile that is a read-write. API security profile, and it's that read-write that is most applicable typically in an open banking context because we deal with read and write APIs there. Um, one of the main differences is, is that read-write is only applicable to confidential clients, so that kind of rules out the single page applications. You really need a client that is able to you know, ensure the, the, the integrity and security of you know, secrets and keys and stuff. Um, and it's typically applicable to those APIs that really are confronted with a higher risk when you talk about accessing data. So in the remainder of this workshop, I will kind of implicitly uh, talk from the perspective of the read and write API security profile. Um, as a kind of summary of, of things that you should be aware of once you start dealing with APIs that uh, are implemented in a FAPI conformance way, um, this is not an exclusive list, but it kind of lists a number of the things that you will certainly come across once you start implementing uh, based on FAPI. So one very important thing is that all connections need to be mutual TLS secured, which means that both for the interaction with the authorization server as well as the interaction with the resource server, which may be an API gateway, you need a mutually uh, authenticated session. So you need to be offering a client certificate as well as accepting the server certificate and all of the keys by the way that come into play need to be accessible as json uh, web key sets um, so that kind of allows you to have a much more dynamic uh, play around those keys so you can rotate those keys rather than using you know static uh, keys stored in a key store somewhere um, i'm not going through this list extensively i mean i'm sure that the uh, the presentation will be shared that you can uh, look at all of the details but um, I kind of included this summary to make you aware of all of the specifics that you need to address once you start creating a FAPI compliant interface. Now, this is not really a walk in the park. And from both a provider and developer perspective, we at Akana think it's essential that as a solution, uh, you kind of hide uh, all of these intricacies as much as possible. And that's obviously what we will look at during uh, the course of this workshop, how we do that. Um, just uh, to give you a little bit of an, uh, of an example of how FAPI differentiates from, uh, let's say, a traditional uh, OAuth or OpenID Connect approach. So on the left side, you see like a traditional standard GET request uh, to the authorization endpoint with a number of parameters in the query string as required by the spec. On the right side, you see the same request, but then FAPI conformance, meaning that all of the uh, required parameters are still there in the query string, but it has added a request parameter that contains a JSON web token, the signed JSON web token, and that token itself contains all of the claims that are deemed critical and that are deemed necessary to be validated by the receiver of the token. So you see that the token contains uh, claims like the audience, like the issuer, like um, uh, the client ID, and even a nonce to make sure that you can't uh, replay this token. Um, all of that is uh, specified in detail in the in FAPI and the underlying OAuth and OpenID Connect specifications. So that again, it allows for perfect automation. Now, this is kind of a brief uh, introduction uh, to FAPI. I hope you have a little bit understanding now, and also that you realize that it's you know it's not exactly easy. Um, Without any, uh, without any help uh, to get it done. So this is obviously where we come in. FAPI made easy or at least easier. Uh, 
And I'm going to show you that from two perspectives. So one from the consumer perspective. So when I, as an app developer, are confronted with an API that is secured um, in a fati conformant manner, then what kind of assistance should I expect or would I like to have that allows me to you know, effectively interact with that API? And in order to give you an impression, we will uh, visit a fairly basic uh, API use case. So obviously, we will work from a client. That client will first need to get an access token, needs to go to the authorization server, authenticate, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, get the token if all is well, and then use the token to access the API. And if the gateway, in this case, that's sitting in front of the resource server or act as the resource server accepts the token, uh, then that API will eventually send a response as well. So these are kind of the four steps that I will show you in that uh, digital banking portal, that consumer portal that I was referring to earlier. So let's switch to the browser session here. Um, what I'm showing you is that digital banking portal that we uh, at Akana recently um, uh, made available. In fact, this is the actual portal. So this is the URL that you can access the portal on. I will share that URL uh, in the presentation shortly. So uh, I absolutely um, um, recommend visit the portal, um, register, and then um, uh, get access to the API products that we've published in there. Um, and you will see that this is kind of a portal that, that kind of mimics um, a banking portal. So that kind of shows how a bank could be offering those uh, API products with a lot of contextual information around it. Uh, but it also allows a developer to you know, get access to the technical details and interact with that API, uh, execute test cases and the like. And the beauty I think is that this portal is essentially a consumer view on uh, the portal that is used uh, by API providers to you know, create and manage those APIs. But I hope to be paying some attention to that later. I'm obviously not going to do the work in this instance. I'm going to use my uh, one of the developer instances for that. So this is obviously a very similar um, portal, but uh, rather than touching the production environment, I can just go in and uh, do some stuff here. So um, as a consumer, uh, what I first need to do is kind of log in uh, in order to get access to the full capability. And then you will see that uh, I've published the one uh, API here in the actual portal. There's actually four products that uh, you can go and visit. So all of these products that you find in the live digital banking portal are based on a common global open banking standards. So we have something, uh, we have UK open banking APIs, uh, one API as published by the Berlin Group, and even an API as published by the Australian Consumer Data Standard. And gradually we will provide the uh, complete security profile with each and every one of these APIs. Um, in this particular uh, development environment, I have already made a few extra steps, um, and that allows me to give you a more, let's say, comprehensive view and understanding of you know, how you could deal with some of the FAPI aspects. So if I look at the details of this particular API, um, I can look at those details here. I can look at the documentation, and this is all coming straight from the, the underlying open API document, right? So the means or the way in which we create such an API is essentially we import the document, um, and the result of that is that all of the documentation is already available, and that that API is really translated into a deployable asset. So it's immediately available on any of the gateway clusters associated with that environment. We also provide a test client, and that test client is obviously what allows you to interact with the API, test the API, both from a functional and from a uh, security perspective, and that's exactly what we will do here. Now, I can approach uh, that API from its, let's say, API perspective, but obviously uh, this API requiring authenticated access, I will always need to provide client details, and that means that I need to associate the client with it, uh, if you register onto the digital banking portal, we will create that client for you. Um, we will create the contract between client and all of the APIs automatically for you. So that means that you can use that client to interact with each and any of those APIs. And that's exactly what I will be doing here. So in this case, I've created, sorry, a third party open banking application, what's in the name. 
Um, and if I hit uh, that application, you see that again, I have access to a test client, but this time from the app perspective. So it's the exact same client, but just uh, you can access it from either API or app perspective. Now, one of the first things that you will need to do if you want to work with an API that is um, configured uh, according to FAPI is that you need to initiate a mutual TLS connection, right? So that means that I will need to uh, associate this particular client with a key store. And that association has already been done. So this client has already been registered with that key. But if I want to use that key in the test client, I will have to upload the key. And that's the first step that I'm going to do here. So here you find my app ID, my client ID. And I'm now going to select the PKCS12 file. It could be either of those types. Um, this file here. Open that and provide a password because a, um, sorry. Typing and talking are two different uh, capabilities. Uh, a key store will always have a password for security, obviously. So now I've uploaded that key store and it means that I can now start with the first step, which means is getting the access token that is required to access this API. So I go to security. You can see that the scope associated with the uh, operation that I'm going to invoke is already pre-selected. I know from the spec that this operation, which is, by the way, the post operation that will give me a consent ID. I will get back to the operation shortly and explain a little bit more about that. Um, I know that it requires this grant type. So this is kind of a FAPI edge case because client credentials is not common under FAPI because usually you uh, request an, uh, an end user to be there, a resource owner. Um, in order to use this particular client authentication mode, which is private key JORT, as you can see in the authentication method box, I need again uh, to refer to a key store. And um, I need to explicitly indicate which of the keys in that key store to, uh, to use. And in this case, it's a key with an ident ident uh, identifier of Akana client one. Also, FAPI restricts me in the use of uh, signing algorithms. So rather than uh, HS or even RS, I have to use PS, so a probabilistic algorithm or an elastic algorithm. So I can select PS256, for example. What will happen now is when I approach the authorization server um, at the authorization endpoint, um, uh, an, a, re a request object will be um, presented as a JSON web token, and the token will be generated by me or for me by the test client, signed with this algorithm, et cetera. So if I hit uh, get token, then the authorization server responds with an access token. So apparently uh, the signature is valid. Apparently I am a registered client, otherwise I would not have gotten um, that token. And the test client will also make sure that this access token is positioned in the authorization header prior to accessing the actual API. So we're gonna invoke this post operation here, which is requesting me for consents that in an open banking use case is the first step really, because that consent ID, uh, it kind of represents what actions I as a third party, as an AISP, am allowed to do on behalf of a user with uh, the account that I would be uh, requesting for eventually. Right, so this is kind of a pre-step. Now, it is a post, so we probably expect some kind of payload. But let's see what happens if I invoke the API without a payload. So there is a response. So the API has actually been called, but you see that an error is returned. And this is one of these things that I was referring to that is not explicitly covered by FAPI, but it's still a very important API security element, and that is validating the entire message. So are all of the required elements there? So we uh, have added an additional policy here in Akana that validates the incoming message against its schema. So it looks at all of the headers, uh, looks at, at payload elements, if there is a payload, etc. cetera. Um, so let's just add a payload. Still no good because apparently uh, an element is missing from the payload. So I really need to provide a payload that corresponds exactly to the schema as it is uh, uh, configured with this particular API resource. Now. If you hit this little link here, it will get you to this page. And that's a page where we uh, provide an overview of all the steps that you need to execute in order to successfully invoke this API. 
meaning taking all of the security considerations into um, into um, how do you say that uh, into consideration. So you can imagine that while we go on in our FAPI exercise, that this document will you know expand and zoom in on all kinds of FAPI specifics. Now at this stage, we only need um, an example payload. So let me copy that. Let me paste that in here. And then let's see what happens next. And hip hip array, now we get a 201 response with a valid response. This is not actually coming from a banking application. Obviously, it's a dynamic mock response. We have hooked up these APIs to a mock server. Um, it's uh, dynamic to some extent. So you see some of the data change here. And I can actually also use this uh, consent ID that has been generated for me uh, to access one of the other operations. For example, we could access an operation that returns details about this particular consent ID. Now, if you look carefully, you see that this button is grayed out here. And the reason for that is, is that the key store is still there, but the OAuth token that I uh, that was granted earlier is not valid for this resource because this resource actually requires a scope of OpenID and accounts. So that also means that I need to use a different grant type. Um, I will now also need to authenticate as a resource owner. So I've hooked this environment up to a third party identity provider. Now we're getting back to the authorization server. This is a field you can ignore. I authorize the app on my behalf. Um, and again, uh, I get an access token, different access token. And also, since you are executing a hybrid flow, I get an ID token. So a JSON web token that contains all of the claims associated with the authorization request that again, the client can validate um, prior to determine what to do next. So it can verify whether the token is valid. Um, whether nothing has been tampered between client and authorization server in between in a FAPI conformant manner. So now I should be able to hit this particular endpoint and indeed it does. And you see that it gives me some uh, mock details regarding to that um, particular um, consent ID. So if I now go back to my presentation to kind of explain what we have seen here, um, um, because that's obviously happening under the hood right? But what we've done uh, is essentially first uh, accessed this post resource of the API, the create consent ID resource. So what the, the test client has done for me is first of all, make sure that that mutual TLS connection was established using the key store that I associated with the client. And secondly, in order to um, send the request to the token endpoint as part of my client credentials grant request, um, a client assertion has been created. So all that has happened on the fly. So again, a JSON web token, a JWS uh, that has been sent to the taken endpoint looks a bit like this, is validated by the server, um, the signature, the, the, the uh, required claims in there. And only when that is fine, it will send the bearer access token. And with that access token, I can then go ahead and access the API and if my uh, request message is valid, then I actually get a response. Then the next action we did was do that follow up get um, um, operation, a call to the get resource with a consent ID. And again, the test client created that mutual TLS connection for me. But this time, the first step was to the authorization endpoint of the authorization server. And then FAPI requires that I send all of the claims in a uh, request object rather than in those uh, query string uh, parameters, even though they are still sent because that's what the spec, the underlying OpenID Connect and OAuth spec requires. So the parameters are still there, but the critical parameters are all included into this uh, JWS here. So that's been created for you. It's sent to the authorization endpoint. If all is fine, the authorization server will respond with a code and an ID token, and that will then um, allow the client again to uh, request an access token at the token endpoint of the authorization server. Again, sending a client assertion that has been created for you uh, containing the claims of this particular client using the private key JORT authentication method at the token endpoint. And if that is successful, an access token is returned. And again, I can do my API request and API response. Now, just imagine that you would have to do all this without such a test client, right? That would require you to build essentially your client uh, and create all of these uh, tokens and objects for you. 
And that's something that you will have to do at the end of the day if you are an app developer. But um, before you do that, I can imagine that you want to have a better understanding of what exactly it is that this API is requiring or that this particular API resource is requiring uh, before you start building your application. And I think having a test client offered in a portal that allows you to kind of preemptively interact with such an API is, is just absolutely beneficial. So that's why we are very keen to um, provide that kind of uh, capabilities uh, to you. So those are kind of the aspects that I wanted to highlight from a API consumer perspective. Now you may obviously wonder, how did these guys get all that stuff in there? Because if you look here, this is clearly a consumer portal, right? There's no means to, um, to, to create an API. And what I explained earlier is that this, this whole uh, digital banking portal environment is essentially just a consumer view on the underlying API portal. So this is the consumer view. We also have a provider view. And if you want to look at the provider view, sorry, and I will take you to this site here. So this is the same portal. Uh, and in fact, I will log into that portal and move to the organization that this particular API that we have been looking at was published under, which is the Akana Bank organization. So if I look at the APIs associated with that organization, then again, you see our FAPI compliant example API. So this is where we do it. This is where we create the um, API. This is where we configure the API, in this case on its sandbox endpoint or in its sandbox environment with a number of uh, Akana policies that are necessary to deal with those security and FAPI aspects that this particular API uh, needs to be associated with. So in this case, it's actually fairly simple because we only need an overall security policy and we have added a message validation policy that kind of validates the request against the, the, the schema associated with each individual resource. So that's what you see here. I can very easily extend, of course, this uh, implementation with additional policies that cover uh, additional security aspects. And for other open banking APIs, you will have to do that because they may require, for example, um, um, the payload to be contained in a uh, JSON web token with a detached payload configuration. So we even offer a, um, a policy for that. And that is actually something that you can test in the actual digital banking portal. That use case is, by the way, fully described on the uh, arcana.docs uh, website. So if you look for open banking use case, you will find all of the details there. Um, in terms of configuring uh, the FAPI um, elements itself, that's actually amazingly easy. So I was mentioning earlier that we want to support FAPI in a no-code fashion. Uh, so let me show you how we kind of deal with that. Um, so if you want to have a present OAuth slash OpenID Connect implementation upgraded, if you will, to a FAPI conformant uh, configuration, then there's essentially only three steps that you need to go through in Akana. So first of all, you need to go to your OAuth domain. And an OAuth domain is essentially where you um, configure an authorization server instance. So this is where you tell what grant types do I want to support at this uh, particular authorization server endpoints? What token types do I support? Uh, should it allow or support OpenID Connect or not? And obviously, what is the uh, authorization server URL that should be used to access this particular instance? That's what you configure in a domain. Um, and those are essentially all generic uh, elements that you can then apply to individual APIs. So they are reusable across APIs. Now, if I want to um, uh, add or, or want to upgrade a domain for uh, FAPI conformance, then I just have to make sure that I also allow the Jolt Bearer assertion ground type. Um, so if you look at um, this environment here, let me look at the domains. There's a great deal of domains here because we use this for many different uh, test cases. Um, but this is where you configure the grant types, and you can see that next to authorization code and client credentials, uh, we have also activated the Jolt Bearer assertion grant type. And that kind of um, allows the use of JSON Web tokens as client claims um, at the token endpoint. So that's step one. Step two is what I've already shown you. You need to make sure that your app is configured with a key store. So it needs to be associated 
with a certificate that can be um, validated, that is trusted by uh, both the authorization server and the resource server. And the beauty, again, about Akana is that if I go back to uh, my um, app and look at the details, that you can actually uh, create those key stores from the UI. So in this case, a key store has already been associated with this uh, particular app. But if not, you will see that this button changes to import credentials, which then allows you to import a certificate signing request. Uh, it will be signed by the, um, the CA that is built into the Akana platform and it will return uh, the associated certificate. So using your private key and the certificate, you can create your JKS or PKE CS12 file that you can then use uh, in the test client to um, execute test cases uh, that require mutual TLS or signing of JSON web tokens, etc. Um, so very, very, very useful in uh, in terms of test. Um, and then last but not least, um, we allow you to kind of uh, constrain um, the um, the methods that a particular client can use to approach the authorization server in what we call the app's OAuth profile. So, for example, you see that for this particular app we have limited the authentication methods to private key jolt. Uh, and that's also what you saw in the test client. Um, we've even um, configured it uh, to avoid um, a replay so that a nonce is included in every request. Um, we can restrict uh, the response type. So in this case, uh, in compliance with FAPI, we have restricted it to code ID token. And there's, there's a great number of settings in addition that you could select, but these are uh, essential uh, from a FAPI context. So those are essentially the only three steps that you need to do. And then you have um, yeah, configured your environment, your Akana environment in this case, um, um, to be uh, uh, compliant with FAPI. Um, let me see, what else is there that I wanted to share with you at this stage? So perhaps, Time permitting, I think we still have like 10 minutes. Um, just a little peek, sneak, uh, sneak preview on uh, how these two portal uh, views, if you will, interact. So if I go back to the provider view, and I go back to that context that I was showing you, so this is an organizational context that we have built in here, a kind of bank. You go back to that one API. Uh, I now could actually go ahead, uh, since I have all of the uh, FAPI configuration in place, domain, um, uh, the stuff that need, uh, needed to be done, and I can go ahead and create yet another API. So for example, I could, let's say, there must be something to upload here. Um, for example, let's see about this Australian one. So let's say that we want to have it as an orchestration, or let's see if the proxy doesn't really matter. Let's make it a sandbox one. Let's deploy it on EU West. Now, assuming that this is a valid uh, OpenAS on Swagger file, I should be able to upload it into my environment. And what will happen as a result of that upload is that this API or the API specification as laid down in that Swagger or Open API document is now imported onto the portal. So you can see that the documentation has been generated from uh, that Swagger or OpenAPI file. Um, so you can review that. Um, more importantly, it has also resulted in an actual implementation of this API. So this thing is now di directly accessible, right? Endpoints have been created, no policies just yet, of course, even though that's something that could also have been applied automatically. We provide metadata-driven policy assignments. So all of this stuff that I'm showing here can also be done in a fully automatic manner, but that's a different workshop, I think. Um, so we now have created this API and it's ready for further configuration. So I could go ahead and apply policies. I could go and hook it up to the uh, MacRespond uh, server, et cetera, et cetera, to have a fully interactive API. Um, and what is nice about this is that if you now look at the overview with that Akana Bank, API um, collection if it's refreshed already because at the back end some uh, indexing takes place. But you can see that it's actually here. And what is even better is that if I now go to my um, consumer uh, view of the APIs, 
if that's already been refreshed, then you see that actually now that consumer data standards API is also here. So it's directly available uh, for consumers as well. So that's, I think, one of the, yeah, one of the significant differentiators that we as Akana offer that we allow you to, you know, create and manage APIs, but at the same time also automatically uh, publish those APIs in a consumer oriented view like this digital banking portal. So that kind of brings me to the end, I think, of this presentation. Again, if you want to access the digital banking portal, just uh, hit on that QR code. Um, feel absolutely free to go there, register, interact with the APIs, learn as much as you can, come back there every now and then. And that's, uh, by the way, a benefit of registering because that means that you will receive emails that uh, will notify you when important changes have been made. So we will be gradually building out uh, the APIs, add APIs, add implementations, uh, add security profile implementations um, so that at the end of uh, the day, or well, that's the ultimate objective that we have really 100% conformant uh, FAPI APIs in there for you to interact with, explore, learn from, etc. So that's uh, all I wanted to share with you. Get started is my recommendation and we still have a little time left. So if there's any questions, then um, please um, feel free to, um, to shoot. <laughs> I do hope that I get some audio feedback now. Um, because for all I know, <laughs> so I'm just waiting uh, to see if I hear anything. It's kind of interesting about these virtual events. I feel all alone. <laughs> Let me quickly switch to uh, to the view here and see if there's anything in my um, in my window. Ah, there we go. Okay, there's a question there. Is FAPI compatible with Open API? Um, that's an interesting question. I think that uh, we are talking two distinct approaches here. So open API is very much uh, meant as a standardized means to specify uh, your, you know, your API structure and semantics into a document, a standardized document that can then be uploaded uh, or that then be, can, can be used to cre create client and server implementations from. FAPI is kind of a dimension on top of that that really specifies the details of the security profile. Part of those details indeed can be laid down in OpenAPI. So OpenAPI obviously allows for the specification of all of the, let's say, required headers that are required with a uh, particular API resource. So that could be um, an authorization header for standard OAuth, but you will also see that there are a number of um, uh, X-FAPI headers used with the UK Open Banking implementation, for example. You can lay these headers down as part of your um, requests and response uh, specification in Open API. Uh, and then when you upload the document, all of these headers, required or not, will immediately be recognized as such. So that would happen if you upload a uh, UK Open Banking Open API document into Akana, for example, all of the headers that are marked as required or all of the other message elements that are required uh, that are indicated as required they will automatically be treated as such and if you apply a validation policy that you know the runtime call will actually be validated in accordance with both the api uh, document and the underlying fapi security profile any other questions at this stage or do you guys need to digest? <laughs> You're most welcome, Belgeet. I do hope it answers your question. Good to hear, thank you. I see still somebody typing, but I don't see any questions just yet. 
So maybe I should just um, close the session for now. So important takeaways from this. Um, FAPI, um, excellent standards, addressing a number of vulnerabilities in a really data way. Uh, I can imagine that FAPI is going to be the standard across financial grade APIs uh, in the time to come. So not only UK open banking, but also standards used for PSD2 and the like. If you want to support your developers uh, dealing with FAPI, then it's very important on the one hand that you will apply an effective application uh, of anything that is required to make your API FAPI conformant. But at the same time, make sure that you also support the developers that are used that are supposed to interact with these APIs, that are supposed to use these APIs to integrate them into, into their application. So provide them with the documentation, provide them with the tools to allow them to, uh, to familiarize themselves with all of the aspects that uh, they need to um, take care of. Thank you very much for your uh, attention this, uh, this afternoon and um, enjoy um, the API Day's excellent event further. Thank you.